Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this work session. Uh, the first thing on our agenda is a proclamation, and this is really for everybody, so we don't have anyone here to receive it in particular, but I'd, I would like to recognize, uh, and, and we can all uh, appreciate the ses, ses, let me see if I can pronounce this, sesquicentennial anniversary of emancipation in Maryland. So 150 years, 1864 to 2014, whereas on October 13, 1864, voters in the state of Maryland approved a new state constitution, and whereas the results of that election to adopt the new constitution were certified by Governor Augustus Williamson Bradford on October 9, 1864, and whereas that new constitution, among other changes, specifically abolished the institution of slavery in the state of Maryland, and whereas this constitution became effective on November 1, 1864, I'm sorry, yeah, November 1, 1864, forever abolishing the institution of slavery in the state of Maryland, and whereas the abolition of slavery in Maryland preceded the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which abolished slavery throughout the nation by more than a year, now therefore be it resolved with the support of the City Council, I, David Geisberts, the Mayor of the City of Hagerstown, do hereby proclaim and recognize the 150th anniversary of the abolition of the institution of human slavery in the state of Maryland. The City of Hagerstown maintains a commitment to the freedom and individual rights of all people and to being a community that embraces diversity and inclusivity, signed by me. So thank you for indulging me in that. I think it is an important milestone to recognize. And with that, we will move on to our first agenda topic, which is the Hagerstown Housing Authority. And we'll welcome back our guests to the table. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I wanted to, I guess we can pick up where we left off, but I think, I know there's been email exchanges going back and forth uh, between Housing Authority staff and our staff mm -hmm. to try to clarify some of the concerns of some of the members of the council about the proposed project sure. at, at uh, McCleary Hill. Um, I'll turn it over to the council to see if they want to start off with some questions they have. I think one of the issues or concerns seems to have uh, been zeroed in on the 75 units uh, that are uh, market rate, mm -hmm. but still subsidized. Is that correct? Maybe you could start off by elaborating more no, about. They won't be subsidized, um, but they they can be. You know, they uh, a Section 8 person could uh, could could have one of those units, but they're not subsidized. You know, by us directly. But they're supposed to be market rate. Yes, the the. Um those 75 units are using uh, private equity, things like reinvested developer fee, deferred developer fee, the land that's donated by the housing authority. Um, so those, it'll be conventional loan, about 6.25% interest. It would, it would be just like a regular landlord Correct. in town. Right, but from that perspective, I, I think we all need to understand that the general public, when they talk about subsidized housing, looks at Section 8 as subsidized housing. Correct. And, and, and I think what's happening here is the theory that when we say it's going to be market rate housing, that what's going to happen is we're not expanding the Hagerstown Housing Authority number of tenancies, but we're expanding exactly what this council has never wanted to see, not only increased rentals versus homeowners, but subsidized housing. So, you know, it would appear to me, having read all this, that that I understand where Kristen is coming from. That as much as it sounds like we're not increasing, quote, subsidized housing, it all depends upon the definition of subsidized housing. And to me, it appears that there's going to be a clear increase in subsidized housing. I support the project. Well, using the word term subsidized housing is including Section 8 housing. I well, mean, uh, I think we have to have an understanding that there's a lot of semantics that we're collectively dealing with. Well, let me, let me qualify. It, we have, uh, the Housing Authority has authorization for 884 Section 8 vouchers. Um, we don't, we, we're never allocated that enough money for those, but we are, we're allocated those, those vouchers. Um, 
where those vouchers are used are you know, up or between that voucher user and a, and a private landlord in town. Okay, so they're all being used currently, is that yes, what you're yes, saying? So, yes. so there would be no overall increase in Section 8 housing. And is this for the city of Hagerstown or Washington County, it's the numbers that you give of the 884? Just the city of Hagerstown. Okay. okay. Yeah. So there's no increase. It's, in fact, the 75 units are market rate, and we're looking for them to be market rate to help support the project. Okay, itself. but I mean, it, this is important discussions to sure. have because I, sure. I understand, I can see one thing you look at that certainly looks like an increase in subsidized housing, but I also understand what you're saying that it's not going to increase the number of Section 8 homes Correct. in the city of Hagerstown. No. Okay. In fact, I mean, the reason why we're doing the 75 units is because to get a market rate, I mean, we can't afford to do home ownership out there, but we can do the market rate and then that can, that will help su support a uh, a, a better clientele Understood. That, in the community. So are there any income restrictions at all about who can live in those 75 units? No. No. No income restrictions. No. Can we have a pledge that there won't be any Section 8? Sure. Well, no, can't pledge can. that there won't be Section 8. I can pledge that there won't be any, uh, um, there won't well, be any increase in the Section 8 units we have in town. That, don't you authorized section eight doesn't the housing no all we do is we qualify the, the resident uh, qualify the person from an income level and there's there's you know four hundred over four thousand families on that wait list ted is it still that if anybody coming up here from the city may carry a section eight voucher is it can they carry a section eight voucher it's just like with the ones that are subsidized that they can move in here and they basically, okay, can have a slot if we do not have any more available here in Hagerstown. They can. They can, can Section do, Eight do the same thing? They can. They can do what they call port. They can port from another another area with a voucher that they got from another Correct. area and bring it here. And Just bring, like ours. and bring it here. So therefore, then they could go into one of the seventy-five. If, if we don't have all of the Section Eight vouchers, if all of ours are used, mm -hmm. they then could. Well, they could go any, any landlord. Yeah, I'm, no. I'm, but I'm just saying, specifics are, mm -hmm. is that looking at a new place, and if they want to come in, then they have the right to be able to do that, if we have used all of the vouchers up here in the city of Hagerstown. Correct, but they can also, but they can also take a voucher from here to another city, and they do that quite often, too. Yeah, I think they're <laughs> finding more that they're coming in here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My objection was, is that I honestly thought there was going to be home ownership, just like up in Hope 6. Mm -hmm. I was very disturbed about that yeah. because I know that, you know, when I had talked to Carolyn, I said, but my hopes were, is that we were going to see more home ownership. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, and the ones that we did at in Gateway, we, we bought those down. Uh, we paid $100,000 for each one of those units so that people would move in there mm -hmm. uh, so that you would have home ownership. And it was a, it was a federal program that they, they don't have anymore. They don't have any longer. No. Yeah, because I, I was of the opinion that it was going to be home ownership. No. Yeah. Um, if I may interject, people historically, the Section 8 people do want to port out of Hagerstown, Montgomery County, places like that. The port ins are not at the, we heard on the same port ratio. Ends. You're saying more people take their Section 8 voucher from Correct. Hagerstown, Washington County and take it to other places. Yeah, which, which we frown upon because then we have, to pay the, we have to pay for that port. So we're paying for somebody to live in Montgomery County, which is a lot higher than living in Hagerstown. They then absorb the Section 8 voucher within theirs. When, when they get the next slot, they then absorb it. So it's not us subsidizing yet another city. It's, it's just a transfer. For a short period of time, we do. Correct. You know, I've been working with staff and trying to figure out this whole Section 8 thing. I'm <clears throat> definitely not an expert in it. And I think there is a lot of uh, confusion or misperception about people on Section 8. But is it not true that? Um, Section 8 vouchers can be revoked for yes. people. Yes. And there is a process for, I know the Housing Authority has a screening process for people who live on Housing Authority property. Uh, and the Housing Authority also oversees the Section 8 voucher program. But there's not always the same level of screening for people when they take that voucher to a private landlord. It's basically up to the landlord uh, to screen that, prop, that renter and then to follow the procedures, I guess, that already exist to revoke a voucher. 
But in talking with our chief of police, it sounds like the issue is people will literally take that voucher from one building after they become a nuisance and literally take it a couple doors down on the same street and be able to use that voucher there. So is there a role for the Housing Authority to play to help landlords keep these problem tenants? Because it can't be the majority of people on Section 8 um, no, from good. creating nuisances in neighborhoods, I think. Because that's obviously one of the things we've been trying to work on through other city codes and regulations is how do we keep our neighborhoods strong? Well, we met with the chief earlier this week uh, to talk to him. It's, uh, the, the problem, and, and the chief knows this too, is that the landlord um, is on Section 8, the own Section 8 program is not checking the references, is not going and, and doing the screening process that we do. Um, but the landlord can't revoke the Section 8 voucher, correct? No, no, the landlord, but the <coughs> landlord can, can certainly, you know, uh, evict that tenant, you know, for, for not doing what they're supposed to do or violating the lease. Um, and then the voucher. Uh, if, if we know about it, and if it's, a, if it's something that is a, a felony or anything that's a, you know, a, a drug related or anything like that, then we can revoke the voucher. Uh, but it's, and they can't just take it to another building. They, you know, the other building has to, has to uh, also meet housing quality standards. We inspect the building. We make sure that the unit meets house, housing quality standards. It's up to the landlord to make sure that the screen tenant the tenants is, right. is, is the proper. Now we talked to the chief earlier this week and, and, and we are ta looking at the possibility of maybe um, working out some kind of arrangement where we start screening Section 8 tenants for landlords, but uh, it's not something that's normally done, um, but it's something that we're looking at right now. I uh, think any chief, kind of partnership that we could yeah, create yeah. to, we just, we to just make that happen, that, I think that's really a neighborhood protection initiative yeah. for mm -hmm. us because, again, it's not, it's not even a small minority. It's just a f very small fraction of these people who are using Section 8 vouchers who are nuisances <coughs> in our neighborhoods. We, and we can tell you exactly which landlords are not doing their job, mm -hmm. you know, but there's not much that we can do about it except for once it, the problem occurs, then we right. can work with the landlord to evict them. And the police department's now been providing us with service calls, address service calls. Okay, we match good. that with our database. That has led to uh, repercussions for certain tenants. Good. I know our chief, he also told me that you guys have met. He's very data-driven, so I appreciate that there's that kind of collaborative sure. effort. Mr. Munz? When you say repercussions, you mean you have actually, uh, you've actually gotten, gotten rid of Section 8 vouchers for people oh, yeah. who have been involved in crimes and right. drugs. Many, t many times. You've eliminated them. Yeah. The problem is that instead of doing it before they get there, it's being done afterwards right. because the screening's not done appropriately. And I didn't mean to get off on a tangent. Huh. That was just yeah. a personal a, inquiry of my own to try good, to clarify that good. because there is a lot of misperception about Section yeah. 8 yeah. and who's responsible for what. And, and then in the um, the inquiries that uh, David was talking about that we're getting, we're finding that only 10% of those that we're getting from the police department are actual Section 8 units that, that we have. Um, so there's, it, the problem, as you probably know, is not just Section 8, oh, it's, it's other landlords sure. in town also. Right. And we're trying yeah. to take measures to address that. So Ted, in the emails, I think John says 90% of the units will be income restricted and the response was that's correct. That is correct. That's 90% of the 325 units correct. will be income restricted. Yes, sir. And, and just make sure, if you would, please, uh, help the council understand what you mean when you say income restricted, that 90% of these units will be income restricted. Well, they'll, you know, if, if they're public housing, they'll have to be 80% of medium income or, or less. In the tax credits, it'll be 60% uh, or, or less. Uh, but the market rate, Units will be will not will not be income restricted. Well, that that leaves 10 percent of the 325. So right. that means 32 units won't be income restricted. I'm, I'm getting lost no. here. Wait, wait, that's, uh, well, I'm, are the 75 units not income restricted? No. no. So I don't. I no. I, I guess yeah, we, I, well, we we said correct that we were. I don't know why the 90 percent was there. When um, John had given the numbers, and I. I don't have a calculator in front of me, but the 90% was, did seem to jive when I threw that in, 70, 75 of 325. It's not 10%. No, it's not. <laughs> I don't know. Here's the so or maybe nine of. Well, the if I may, yeah. uh, since it's 
something I had written. It's your email. Yeah. Um, Ninety nine is ninety percent of your of the first phase. Okay. Of the first uh, phase. So ninety percent of phase one. Oh, phase one. Of phase one, yes. Will That's be income restricted. Okay. And yeah. of that, sixty three of the income restricted units will be restricted to a thirty percent area median income. Uh, Sixteen of the units will be restricted to um, forty percent. And then based upon the housing's author housing authority's uh, application, what they are calling market rate is actually their target is 60% of area median income. And is that lower than the guidelines that you have to use right now? 30% of the area median income for how many units, John? 30% is for uh, 63 of the units, I believe, right? Or 67, 67 of those or 30 percent, 16 units are 40 percent. That they can't exceed that level. Correct. And you're talking about the first phase when you're using those numbers now? Right. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. So just of the first phase, yes. right. 63 units have to be for people with 30 percent of the area median income or lower. Yes, and then 16 units at the um, uh, 40 percent. The nine units would not have uh, income restriction per se in, in terms of uh, the market rate but uh, I believe uh, Mr. Shankel the numbers you all were using is that it'll be 60 percent of area median it, it is their target because I think for Ted and Dave at least from where the staff is trying to evaluate this and understand these numbers and if we're asked by the council are we concentrating poverty at a higher level in this neighborhood and exists now. No, no, you are not. Okay, and, and help us understand why we're not. Well, we, it, it, I, I wish I would have got the statistics of how many folks out there are on zero income right now. So it's, you know, we, we have to allow a certain amount, but you'll find that if you, if you look at the exact same thing we have at Gateway Crossing. And the income levels have, raised, have risen from there from, I think it was like 13000 to $23,000. Uh, so it's, it, it sounds, we have to make the application sound the way it is. But the reality is that you'll find that, you know, especially with uh, brand new units, that the, uh, uh, you'll find that people want to move out there that have a higher income level. But, but if you're saying that 79 of these units can't exceed 40% of area median income, in phase one, mm -hmm. how can they have higher income than what they have now, which is a minimum of 60, right? Well, I'll leave that to David because he's been seeing well. experience at, he's seen experience. Okay. So maybe that's, that's my confusion there, but I, it I just understand. seems like we're lowering right. the income <clears throat> and on paper levels I understand. For, and increasing the, the, I'll say the density yes. of poverty, both in Hagerstown and in the neighborhood. Right. I understand. The, I think where that theory goes wrong is looking at the maximum income for, for each of those 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. When you have, um, Nolan right now is 80% of AMI. 80% um, right 80%. Now. Gateway Crossing is 60%. So looking at the income limits just purely from um, the maximum allowable does not work because Gate Noland, your average family income is 13 something. 13,000. Gateway, it's 23,000 and something. So it goes to show even though the income limits are lower, the true basis is what is the composition of your earned income families in there? So could you mention people with zero income? Well, so <laughs> where would those people go? Uh, I mean, subsidized if they, if uh, people, subsidized I, what I hear you saying is, People with, even though they're still considered poor, they have higher poverty income, but there's, so there's gonna be an increased number of those, and there'll be less people with zero income, so it kind of begs the question, where do those people go? No, it's, it's, it's it, the income restrictions are, are that, at the higher end. Uh, you know, if, if someone comes with no income and qualifies, they, they will be moving in. Okay. You will find, though, that it's almost impossible to survive on zero income because right. your utility allowance <laughs> is so small, and also community service hours come into play with that. That's a HUD regulation. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's there's a small amount of 
folks on zero income, which we always wonder about that. <laughs> but but what I, again, what I'm hearing is that there are income limits. Yes, the, the incomes might be higher than the average for Nolan Village now, but that, that there are various restrictions at different levels on those 75 units. They're on the tax credit units, yes. Not on the 75 units. Not on the 75, but just okay. on the other How units. many of them are tax credit units? It's going to be a one-for-one -one ratio. So you have 250 units at Nolan now. You'd have 250 income-restricted units in the end. So it's... it's. Uh, I'm talking about the 75 one. units that are the market rate. Mm -hmm. they're, they're targeted at 60% now because that's what the market will pay. You know, if the market would pay higher than that, then they can, the rent will be higher than that. If we wanted to charge 2000 a month for it, we could, but we're just... 60% of AMI, not, right? Is it when you say 60%? Yes. 60% of AMI. Yeah, that's where the market rate rentals fall in if you're looking at a income chart showing the 60%. I, I can assure you the same questions could have been asked about Gateway Crossing. Okay. Um, but Gateway Crossing is, you know, it, is, the, is the model of which we're using here for, for McClary Hill. Uh, with the exception of the home ownership, and the home ownership really doesn't play into this at all. Um, so it's it, and and what we've seen is the incomes have risen considerably. We we were trying to find the data that we had when it was Westview, uh, but if I remember correctly, it was around it was around sixty five hundred dollars uh, was what the income was around two thousand two, um, and at Westview, and the income level, the average income there now is over twenty three thousand dollars. John, I think you had your. You wanted to say something? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I, I think as we evaluate uh, whether or not uh, income levels are increasing or we have a diverse income neighborhood, um, I think one thing that would help staff at least understand this better is to not look at an average income, uh, especially when X number of your residents have zero income. Uh, an average is the... Uh, least accurate way of, of looking at what it is that we're building in terms of a community. Uh, it, would, it would help staff if we knew how many residents were at 30 percent of AMI, at 40, at 50, at 60, and at 80. We can present that. We can give because, you that. Because um, to, to say you have an average, um, you, you could theoretically have uh, 200 units at 60% AMI and 50 units at zero and come up with an average where they'd be right at about 40% um, AMI because that's going to draw it down to about 24,000. Uh, so uh, I, I, would, I would ask perhaps uh, that we could get numbers like that to better understand the community. Uh, as we have read more and more about the low-income housing tax credit properties, uh, we have found that a um, frequent concern is that uh, the uh, program is designed uh, in such a way that you end up with a concentration of poverty uh, because they look at low-income census tracts. And uh, so it's the design of the program to keep poverty concentrated, uh, even though that flies directly in the face of HUD's goal of uh, further affirming fair housing to reduce the concentration of poverty. And, and, and that's based upon articles and that that we have read from, from HUD's website uh, that, uh, but that's it, it, that, that it's a, a concern that has been raised in other uh, low-income housing tax credit uh, properties. But that's not been the experience in Hagerstown. That's also of the same assumption that all market rate units would be Section 8. Yeah. So it's, it's I mean, we can, we can provide the demographics to tell you exactly how many uh, folks we have with, with different in income at Nolan Village and at, and at Gateway so you can see the comparison. Um, you know, it's, again, you know, and, and I, I know you get tired of hearing this, but uh, if we don't do anything, you got Nolan Village. Mm -hmm. and yeah, but if you do your project and the word gets out that here's, you can get a great unit in, uh, for your Section 8 allowance, then the word does get out, it networks, 
apparently you all can't turn them down if they have the right income level and your rents are fall hmm. within the program. The, the you have you you have it. Uh, the seventy five quickly go because nobody wants to that can that's restricted to private payments will want to go there. I mean, it makes enough income that they don't qualify. So we get 75 more subsidized units in one place. Yes, theoretically, it's not within your total of 884 or whatever it is, but it's still concentrated. Uh, well, and then you have another piece of ground, just uh, what it would be west of there, that northwest of there, that, that I'm a little worried about that. Yeah. The, the difference would be if, if a Section 8 person would, were to move into that property, we would do the screening because we'd be the landlord. Yeah. And we would make sure that, that that Section 8 person has the same kind of credentials that anybody who would rent from a, la uh, a landlord would. That, that's the big difference. Uh, we have Section 8 folks living at, at Gateway Crossing, and we don't have any problems with them. You know, it's, it's, it's the stigma of Section 8, it's, it, and the reason why that stigma is there is because landlords don't do the screening they're supposed to do. When we screen them, we don't have, I mean, no, don't get me wrong. We have problems from time to time, but we also have uh, security, and, and, the, and their, main, their main responsibility is, is intelligence gathering. You know, if we have live-ins or we know that there's drugs or something like that, we focus in on them and they're gone. Um, it's the reason why we have the reputation we do in the industry. I guess I come back to the idea of revoking these vouchers and how many you might revoke in a year and how that compares with other jurisdictions. I'd be curious for my own knowledge about that. I guess one other question generally about this project is the input, and I know that uh, you presented, you, like this came to a meeting with us, just uh, myself and Bruce and, and you at the staff, and of course I can't make any decisions because the council has all the power at this table. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there a process or will there be a process for uh, public input whether it's the current Nolan Village residents and or the surrounding neighborhood when it comes to planning this. I know it'll have to go through the Planning yes. Commission. Yes, it, there will be. And, can you and talk more about that? And I'm not familiar with any of that, how that went down with the gateway crossing, but. Uh, well, it was, it, was a, it was a rather long drawn out process with gateway crossing. Uh, but, and what we plan on doing, we put this application in uh, and we're not, I mean, it's probably 50-50 if we're going to be approved or not. But one of the reasons why you put the application in is to find out what you have to do to improve the next time so that you make sure that you win next time. Uh, but you know, it, before anything is done out there, there will be community meetings and the community will have some input into what we're going to do. Um, they'll, be, they'll look at the architecture. They may have um, thoughts on, on how they would like us to modify the architecture. We'll have those meetings before we even go to the planning board. Because you know we want to make sure that and, and it'll be with the people in the community and it'll be with the community, the surrounding community. Well, I think um, it's important for people to hear you talk about that process because yes. I think a lot of folks hear us talking about it and it, it's like a, it's a done deal and it's going to start happening tomorrow and and there hasn't been the opportunity for that input. So, no. Mr. Munson, refresh my memory. Um, if no one village is not replaced. What's the cost going to be to, to the taxpayers to maintain it? Well, just to maintain what we have, we're looking at eight to ten million dollars in the next five years, and that'll take all the reserves we have. Um, one of the things that you, you may have noticed in this is that uh, the developer fee that we're making, we're donating it back into it. You know, the, the work that the housing authority does on this, the housing authority does not get paid anything extra for it. This is just something that that we feel like we should do for the city. Um, and I mean, it, yes, it, it makes life easier for us if we replace a Westview with a Gateway Crossing or a Nolan Village with a McClary Hill. But there's thousands and thousands of hours that work uh, that the Housing Authority goes into to doing this. So it's we will, you know, we don't want to do anything that the community is not comfortable with. Uh, you know, we have a resident advisory board, and there's been a representative from uh, Nolan Village that's been on the resident advisory board. Then we've been talking about this for for around a year, but you know, everybody and every communication that we've had has been that we are planning this. This is not a definite done deal. Uh, the only reason why we went in for the financing with, uh, with the state, is, as I said earlier, is that we were encouraged to do that by the secretary. And, and we thought, 
well we can we can if we get the funding which is the hardest part the other part can come on the back end yeah even if we have the funding we don't have to do it we can always give the money back you know it, and we're not going to do anything unless the city and the planning uh you know you know planning everybody's happy with it well the majority are happy with it <laughs> is there a requirement that you maintain nolan village is there a requirement as far the as the housing authority that under your agreements with hud that you have to have those number of units in hagerstown or replace those units with new ones there no, i don't think there's any requirement you know it's what it's what most cities want to have for affordable housing i can assure you if we went over the mountains they would die to have this program in frederick and montgomery county ted the number of section eight uh, people in a community is that a number that's established by the federal government it's it's been one that i think has has accumulated over the years you know um uh, it, it, it's always surprising to me that, you know, that Hagerstown does have a lot of affordable housing. Uh, but Hagerstown, when I grew up, was the big town. You go to Frederick, was. where I grew up, was a cow town, and you got 400, uh, you know, uh, public housing units there and about 600 vouchers in a, sound, a city of 50, 70,000 people. So it's, it's, it's disproportionate here. There's no question. And it needs to be pushed out to the county. And it, it needs to be done. I've been saying that for about 15 years now, um, but the county doesn't seem to do anything about it. What are your thoughts on a consolidated city and county housing authority? Well, when since I, both of you, I mean, both entities will be short an executive director here soon, it seems like the prime opportunity to look at consolidation. 16 years ago, we did. We looked at it, um, and at that time, the county it's, there's only a five-member board of commissioners that we have. The county was insisting on two members on the board, and they only at that time had 200 public housing units, and our board didn't like that. So it's really a matter of how, what the structure of the board would be and who uh, gets to appoint who. Uh, and I think it's a real possibility. Those nuts and bolts issues. I think it's a real possibility, too. Councilmember Alshard talks about the efficiencies of government, and I think it's one of those things where we do have to look at why this city takes on such a disproportionate amount of the county's poor. Uh, I think that's definitely a question that has to well, be. And as you know, all the services are concentrated in the city too. So it's, it's, we definitely you know, I, I understand. I, I, and I'm not just saying this because I got 62 days. But, <laughs> but who's counting, but, right? But it's, but it, it's, it, 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 it's the smartest thing to do. It really is. Yeah, it, it's, it's way overdue. You know, it, it, it will, it will be difficult for the housing authority of Hagerstown to deal with that because then they're going to have to deal with all these jurisdictions. Um, but and also they've already in the county they've they've done they've they've taken all their public housing units and converted them into something it, it's kind of a mess but we could fix it well Someone i'll help them if they it. want <laughs> well i know we're going over our time and i promised the council that we would try to stick to our agenda uh, i guess this will be a continuing conversation sure. uh, but i appreciate your willingness to come and answer I, our questions and I, can I can I say one more thing please. I, I, I would hope that you would if you're not going to support it uh, don't hurt it um, because we don't have to do it mm -hmm. you know but getting the funding is 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 really difficult and the only place that you can get funding now is the state and um, you know I'm sure you know I could talk to our board of commissioners and we could have a written agreement with the city that that if, if the city decides after we've gone through all these motions that we have to do to meet with the communities and things like that that we, we would pull it back if it wasn't supported by the city council but I'm I'm just asking don't hurt the application at this point please. I don't think there's any desire to do that I think uh, my most difficult task has been to try to figure out what exactly the position is that we're taking because we really are talking about the funding of the project uh, but there are all these other questions about the project itself that seem to kind of overshadow you know it's like putting the cart before the horse and I think uh, it's been the biggest struggle I but understand. I don't think there's any desire I think everyone agrees that a redevelopment of that area would be nice and it would definitely uh, be a benefit to the people who live there. Well, I, I can assure you the income restrictions is not something that we desire. It's something that if you're going to get the funding from the state that you have to do. It's, I mean, we would make it all market rate if we could get away with it. Sure. Let me ask. Sure. 
Would you clarify something for me? I, I don't think there's anybody who's interested in a concentration of poverty. But does that imply, I mean, there's going to be poverty. That's the history of uh, the world. Does that imply then if there is no concentration someplace, and I, I don't mean for this to apply specifically to this discussion, this is a general question, then the poverty that exists is going to be someplace else in different neighborhoods, essentially. Is that? Is that? Well, I think that's, that's so, fair to say. Uh, I, I really think a lot has to do with how it's managed. Okay, know? I and, think. And, you... and making sure people are responsible. Yeah. And, and that's the one thing that, we, that I think we do very well. You do. Yeah. I think, Don, that part of it's the dispersion. I mean, the city we just heard absorbs a, a different share of Section 8 than, let's say, our neighbor Frederick. We just heard the county does, I don't think they have any family units. It's all senior, isn't it? That's right. They don't have any family units, any. And yet they have urban areas. Everything around Hagerstown is an urban area that's outside our corporate boundaries. They have zero. So I think it's dispersion as much as anything else. And, 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 and I guess I'm still trying to nail down whether or not this will wind up being a net increase within Hagerstown, and I think we have absorbed our fair share. I'm not against trying to provide good housing for people in poverty, I'm not against it. I just wonder how healthy it is for Hagerstown, Ted. That's No, I, I that's understand, all. I understand exactly. And, and if I had some, and I do appreciate that you screen your tenants and all that, I, I but uh, I, the 75 units, I'm still trying to get my head around exactly how that's that all's gonna work, and I think there, the rest of us are too. Well, not we, just me. We thought we thought the 75 units would be a selling point because you know it. it we have found, uh, mm -hmm. as much as I, we have found that people don't want to move from Gateway Crossing even when I mean we've got people that make seventy thousand dollars a year living out there, you know, because they want to live there. You know, it's, it's in town. Ownership. It's the prettiest place. It's it, home ownership. No, no, these are these are renters. I have a these family are, that makes a hundred thousand a year that lives there. Yeah. In fact, we would like them to move so that you know we could put people in there that that need to be there. But once a person moves in, uh, there, there's nothing that requires them to move out. But, but I hear that there's restrictions on how much you can make. No, that's when you move in. Oh, so what you, you make move after in that? In making thirty thousand. Yeah. We have people, and, students moving in, and then they get they. Then we have a surgical nurse who's making seventy thousand dollars a year that doesn't want to leave, leave Gateway Crossing, uh, and I'm we're hoping that that's what you're going to have at, at uh, McClary Hill when we build something really a quality product. product. There's there's been some concern expressed to us in an email that we received um, about the local streets around this project being extended, disturbed, or something. I think, uh, what was it, Armstrong Avenue? Somebody is scared to death that Armstrong Avenue is going to be put through, I guess, essentially the Sweeney Drive, I don't know. Uh, are there any uh, plans or any thoughts about doing any of that? No, no I, I mean, first time I've heard that. <laughs> it's gonna be Sweeney Drive, essentially. I think that's the way it's designed right now. I'm, I'm not real familiar with, yeah. without looking at the design. Yeah. But um, in fact, we're talking to the, to the chief about making it one entrance into right, the right. property. That's what so, he said. Yeah. Yeah. And we're meeting, we're meeting with, um, um, what's his name? Um, uh, Officer, Officer Kendall? Kendall. On Septed. Friday. On right. Friday. Yeah. Crime yeah. Prevention Through Environmental Design. Right. Yeah. And we're meeting with our architect before that. So to, to, to design it more for what police, what security would like. Right, one yeah. way in, one way out. Yeah. That's so we're, what looking at. Yeah, we, I, I can assure you, we're going to do anything you that we talk can. Talk to the fire department about. That. <laughs> right. Well, that's that, better talk that, to the fire department. That, that was one of the concerns. In fact, that we're talking about putting. After a, looking at some of these streets here in town, I don't know. Well, we're talking about putting a gate on one end where the fire for department emergency, emergency right. vehicles. Right. right. Yeah. Apparently, yeah. statistics show that violent crime is reduced in communities or neighborhoods where there's one right. entrance in and one entrance right. out. Yeah. And there's going to be cameras everywhere. Yeah. But that's a good thing. Yeah. I fault mm -hmm. for those out there. Yeah. 
I just would like to know, and it may be off the topic, but security, security is going to remain the same amount of people or more? Yes. Yes. Same amount? Yes, as long as we can afford it. Okay. But wait a minute, that raises this issue. Mm -hmm. If you have to use your reserves to essentially rebuild Nolan Village, uh, you're not going to be able to afford security, right? Well, I, I can only tell you this, that we used to um, pay for security our resident services out of our capital fund. And HUD came out this year to say that you can't spend, you can't use capital fund money for that anymore. So we're using our operational funds to do it. And you know, we're, we're fine. Well, we're fine. We've got, you know, four and a half, five million dollars in reserves. Um, but if we have to start using that money to pay, to put roofs and sewage systems and things like that at, uh, at Nolan Village, uh, that could make it very difficult well, in the, the future. Then your but security not, is going to have to fall. Yeah. But I mean, we, look, we, when I started here, we had a security force of 28 people. Right. Um, and it cost us a million dollars a year. We were down to a roving patrol with, with where we focus in on problem areas, and we're doing it for about $450,000 a year, and we're, we're, we're good. Uh, we're good for as long as we don't have to spend a ton of money on Nolan Village. Yeah, but we do like security. Yes, I understand. <laughs> and we do too. Security. Believe me, it, it, without that, we would have more problems in the community. That and the Boys Girls Club are, are, are the two biggest things we got going for us. When it's it comes an excellent to facility. I was there briefly for the ribbon cutting. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry, we could probably talk for another hour, but we must well, we move on in our agenda. We'll come back. Okay, well, we we're just might regulars. take you up on that offer. <laughs> okay, we're, we're, we're right. trying to be regulars. We, we don't mind. Okay. okay. Well, I really do appreciate it. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Next item is the Catalyst Project number one, RFQ for a developer partner for the office development. Take it Good away. Afternoon. Good afternoon. We are here um, back with you this week to begin discussion of the details of a uh, draft request for qualifications for the um, Catalyst Project number one in the Community City Center Plan, which is the Office Development and Recruitment Project. And as we briefed you on the 21st, when we gave you the um, action report on how we've been doing implementing the plan, we worked with urban partners to draft this document to help us uh, secure a developer partner for the project. And the reason they, were, they suggested a request for qualifications rather than a request for uh, proposals is that we, we generally know how we want to move forward with this project. What we need is a process to help us identify a developer partner who's qualified to do the project the way we want the project done. Once we've, we've identified the qualified partner or candidate, then we would negotiate the path forward under the parameters that we've outlined in this document. And so what we've had, we put together for you to help with this discussion today is a PowerPoint that's based on the, um, the fact sheet that was, that's just behind the, um, behind the memo. It's called, oddly enough, fact sheet. And so just to help things along, we grouped it together thinking of how you mo most likely would have questions about this. And so here, of course, is the summary that's been in all of our action report documents, the Catalyst Project Number 1 with the Office Development Recruitment. The goal is to position the downtown to compete for new office development using portions of the central parking lot to build 154,000 square feet across three buildings. You see the map on the left there. Later on, I'm going to talk about sites A1, A2, and B. A1 and A2 are on North Potomac Street, which is to the left of that map, Site B is on East Washington Street. And the rendering to the right was created for us by um, BFM to show what a building could look like inserted into the streetscape along North Potomac Street. OK, there we go. The first um, area that we wanted to talk about is the quantity of development anticipated. And this is what was proposed by urban partners in the community city center plan is that it would be up to 154,000 square feet across portions of the lot and on the M&T bank parcel. A1 is the city-owned parking lot on North Potomac. A2 is the M&T bank property at 32 North Potomac Street. Site A1 and A2 together has a potential for 118,000 square feet in a four-story building in two phases. Site B is the city-owned parking lot on East Washington Street, which has a potential for 36,000 square feet, again, a four-story building. Um, in terms of land use types anticipated, and if, if you have questions at any time, um, chime in, because th this is, uh, okay. 
Uh, these are both uh, streetscape lots. They border on Potomac and Washington. And I um, didn't have a chance to go back and look at the study, but isn't there further plans that in later phases we go farther into the interior of the surface lot? Right, this That's, would be just the initial plan. These are just the initial. That's what I thought, but I wanted mm -hmm. to make sure people understood. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, could you define the... Um, M and T lot. I, I don't know exactly what you mean there. It's Does the that include their driveway? Yes, the, bank, the driveway the and their building. The whole, right. build, it's the whole mm -hmm. building. The whole building. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they'd be selling their, selling yeah. their building you essentially. You can see it on this page five. On yeah. Hi. Okay. Um, and so, in terms of land use types anticipated, again, we uh, went through this as we uh, put together our thoughts on this RFQ with Urban Partners. It anticipates that the ground floor of the building would have storefronts on the street to give active pedestrian traffic generation tra traffic generating uses and the types of uses we're thinking about are the ones of that category that are allowed in the downtown restaurants retail bars art galleries performing visual arts studios fitness centers banks that type of thing and if a drive-through is desired that we would like the uh, that to be accessed off the alley rather than straight off the street. Okay, let me let me ask this question: mm -hmm. Is there not going to be bail bonds allowed? <laughs> there are not going to be hookahs, hookahs allowed, nor tattoo joints. Is that right? We have not included that on the list. That had been our thought. Can we do something to make sure they're not allowed? Right, we can make this as as tight as we want in the RFQ. Okay, I think we need to do that. Okay. Thank you. And then on the second and the third floors, as well as rear areas on the first floors, it's anticipated that would be offices and that we would include in the RFQ that this would not include social service agencies or ambulatory health care entities. Then for fourth floor and higher, we have that we would be willing to entertain non-office uses. However, we would not be interested in entertaining low-income housing. Uh how do, you preclude, how do you preclude a permitted use within a zone? In terms of? Well, we, we just identified probably 10 different uses that we're going to preclude from an RFQ that somebody's going to submit. We, uh, the way I understand this RFQ being submitted is I'm developer X, and I'm going to bring a... Mike. I'm developer X, and I'm going to bring a presentation to you, the city. And within this presentation, I'm going to identify the uses uh, within this development that I plan to construct um, in concert with what you're looking for. And 10 years down the road, there are still 20 permitted uses within a zoning district. Uh, if I'm now the private property owner of the property uh, and I sell it and let's see it gets sold four times over in that time period uh, if if housing is an approved use within this structure and section 8 vouchers are a program administered by the state they're not a housing type what restriction do we have to four owners removed to say you're not allowed to participate it participate in a state approved program which isn't a housing type uh, any more than we are uh, able to say uh, you're you're not permitted to to uh, provide retail space for use x or service y uh, in that building. Uh, on the storefront angle, it'll be a little bit easier to get at what you're talking about when, if we are implementing what's currently under review with the Planning Commission right now, which is actually across a designated area of the downtown, not just these two sites, saying that storefronts can only be occupied by certain pedestrian traffic generating uses. And so then we won't have this difficulty of trying to figure out what was this agreement 20 years from now. It will be with any, yeah, but, hopefully, that would be part of the land management code. And I, and I guess I, I'm interested in this traffic generating uses. I mean, we, are we, I mean, let's say a church. And a church 
generates a, a minimal amount of foot traffic, you know, one day a week in any number of, of religious institutions, you know, that, that, that exist now, I, I'm, I'm just trying to, to formulate in my mind how we're going to go out and, I guess, pitch this to a potential developer when we, we're, we're, we're anticipating restricting fairly significantly uh, an unknown quantity of things that uh, are conceivably for this investment purchase permitted by right. Right, and again, if this moves forward with the Planning Commission and the Mayor and Council, by next spring or so, the Land Management Code would have it spelled out that in an area that we're referring to as a storefront protection zone in the CCMU, there's a specific list of what is permitted in the storefront. Mm -hmm. So for this developer, all of his competitors in the same area would be subject to the same list of permitted uses in storefronts. It's the upper floors, however. That would be taken care of through land management. Right. The upper floors, though, what we've got on here, that would be more a case of this particular proposal. It's not something that's being proposed in the land management code. We would have to talk with the city attorney on what would be the best way to set that up if we wanted to ensure that could move forward. Otherwise, if we can't, maybe we have to think about whether we want to include housing. Well, and we have to. I, th I would think that as a part of the condition of whatever incentives we offer, whether it's free land or whatever it is, that we could put whatever strings we want to in there for the developer in order to entice their investment and construction. We, we, we did that with, with a, a, a comparable agreement with another uh, uh, housing uh, uh, property uh, uh, downtown that, that over the course of time uh, was clearly uh, changed because you're not dealing with a permitted use, a type. You're dealing with programmatic items. Uh, well, let's hear the rest of the presentation. Uh, one, one Ms. Of, uh, Go ahead. Go ahead, Marty. Well, I had a question, kind of the opposite of Kristen's, and Kristen's was a good one. Um, I think we need some way to define that we want a high quality office building, whether it's using the old Class A or that what we're seeking here to me is, is something that will be a very, very uh, good quality project to set the model, set the tone, and also provide space that's, is, that I keep hearing is not available in the rest of downtown. If we just build competition for the Class B space, then I'm not quite sure what we're doing. So I think we need to find a way to say that we're looking for first rate, class A, or whatever the term might be on number B. And then on number C, I would say, put that term first and then put in parentheses, non-office uses will be considered so that it's clear it's fine to build high quality class A offices fourth floor and higher. Because the way I read that, it sounds like we want something else. What we're saying is something else might be optional, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we should just make it clearer. So C would have the same definition of offices and then say, we will, at least at this point, we'll consider these others. And I would like to see some kind of covenant, if we can get it in there, that runs with the building or with the land might be another way we might accomplish some of this. You know, and that would answer the ownership issue, if we can still do that. Right. Like a well, deed, deed restriction or something? Yeah, something mm -hmm. like that. Well, clearly, there's no developer in the world that's going to build Class A office space and Section 8 housing in the same building. <laughs> right. It, it, if you can pull off the Class A office space, you don't have to worry about the other. It doesn't work, yeah. and it won't work, and it would never work. And I, I think you're think right. They just any developer it, right. who would ever consider it. Uh, we have landlords in town who unfortunately have decided to try that mix and it clearly does not work to have office space and irresponsible um, residents living Even in the same building. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, so I, I, I think if you try to emphasize the class of the office space that you're looking for, everything else falls into place. Bruce, did you want to say something? Well, just that I think, too, as we think about this, we're, we're the landowner, we're providing incentives, so we're not, in this case, it's not the same as applying 
requirements or conditions on a privately owned property. Mm -hmm. This is our property, so I think we can set forth some of these expectations pretty clearly. Yeah, I think it's just right, but I think Christian's concerned about subsequent purchasers after everything right. else. And I think that's build. where we yeah. get into the covenants or the conditions. Right. It's a good point, but I, th I think we can work through them is what I'm trying yeah. to say. What you mean is we're in a good situation. We're in a different situation than yeah. talking about applying right. zoning to a privately right. owned building or right. property. This is our property right. here. And that's why it's good mm -hmm. to get this framed right. Yeah. yeah. But it's good to be thinking about how we can set it up so it's easy to ensure that continues forward. 10, 20 years the future, now. right. Yeah. Also on page eight of the RFQ, we do mention the class A and um, not summarized on the fact sheet, but we did emphasize the uh, mm -hmm. quality of the building and we can reinforce that. We just reinforce it everywhere. <coughs> yep. yeah. And then acquisition costs for land, what we're anticipating is that for the city owned site A1, which is the po parking lot on Potomac and site B, which is the parking lot in East Washington, we would make it available free of cost as a city contribution to the project. For the M&T bank owned site, the availability would be subject to negotiations between the developer and M&T <coughs> bank. M&T bank has indicated to us they are conceptual supportive of the project and open to negotiations. And then if any other city owned uh, uh, lots on the central parking lot were desired by the developer, then we, we anticipate that would go through the city's competitive negotiated sales process. That we're not anticipating that future sites would still be offered for free but again as with that process it all depends on what's being proposed by the developer any questions about that okay but, but it is just clarifying it is definitely our intention at the moment to at the end of this process these would be privately owned and taxed right buildings Mm -hmm. There might be different ways of getting there, but that, mm -hmm. that's the end result. Right. Okay. And that's what this next one is, when is the land transferred? And mm -hmm. that's, uh, we're not anticipating that we would transfer the land immediately because what if the developer does not come through and then the right. land is gone? So that's a case of we'll have to figure out negotiating with the developer yeah, with so a just, selected candidate is exactly when will the land transfer, but the goal is it will transfer. When we cut the ribbon on it, <laughs> <laughs> it's finally constructed. And number five, the parking provision, as recommended by Urban Partners, what we have in the RFQ is that the city will make available 280 off-street parking spaces at prevailing prices, however, not in the A&E deck. So that would be in any of our facilities within walking distance of here. The, I mean, the last figures I saw, and I think Eric alluded to the fact that we've, we've sort of over-committed spaces in the A&E deck, so, so that, you know, that's obvious. Um, I, I guess 625 deck spaces, 575 permits issued, it's 50 available spaces. I mean, it doesn't take long to figure that folks are going to, to, to increase usage of, of the deck across uh, the street, the, the university deck, which is also seeing, uh, you know, opportunity for increase. I'm just, uh, I'm curious where these 280 off-street parking spaces are. I mean, because most afternoons, the central lot is is, is fairly full. Uh, a lot of them would be in the north or the university district. That you know, based on that report we gave you a month or so ago, where and Eric chimed in when we looked at different times of the day. We were rarely at more than 50% occupancy at the university deck. The university deck has 411, something like that. Right, about a little over 400 spaces, right? Right. So if you're at half of that, that's 220. That's 220 that you may have available. run through uh, some of the incentives. Um, we're recommending and asking for um, council review of transfer of the city-owned land free of cost um, and recommending reserving a minimum of uh, 250000 in the first third grant program for the first building. And this would be on 
um, whichever site the developer chooses first um, and uh, asking for consideration of reservation of um, additional 250,000 from the first third grant program for subsequent buildings and that could be either utilization of the grant program two times or three times depending on if site A is built in one phase or in two phases. The PEP program would be available to the developer with the real estate uh, tax grant back for five years, as well as waiver of permit and plan review fees. There's a, a small uh, component of free and discounted parking for five years under the PEP program, which would be available. It, if, if you could just back up a second. This recommended reserving at minimum 250,000 the first third grant program for first building. Is this the only reservation we have in the first third grant program right now? There, there was um, a reservation for the uh, student housing program with USMH. Which is how much? 250000 so for that. So am I assuming then that $500,000 is being reserved for those two projects? Correct. That, and that's the recommendation okay. in order for two I, of the catalyst projects to move forward with the support of the first third program. I'm just trying to f figure this out in my head. So that leaves a million and of that million we've had um, three or four projects come through which have eaten into that remaining million X number of dollars. Is or are there time frames that we're establishing for these two reservations? In other words, I guess I don't want to to, to get question. six months from now and these aren't gaining the traction and I'm envisioning what's that guy that wanted to do the Baldwin house that they drug it out for a year before they decided yeah. to do the university mm -hmm. uh, I forget his name I don't want to get to that point six months from now and go okay we we have now pushed aside three other projects because we're sitting on five hundred thousand dollars for two that aren't gaining the traction we envision in a time frame that we establish I think that's a, that's a very good, a good point. point that we can um, take a look at the utilization of that program to date, the reservations, and come back with some more information. Yeah, I'd be interested to know what's eaten up and, and yeah. where we're well, at. Well, I would also like if there's quality projects and good opportunities for you all to bring it to us. And if we need to adjust timing and so on and so forth. Or if there's good opportunities, I think it should be brought to the council and see where we There is an expiration on approved yeah, if they grants don't. if they don't happen in a certain time frame, correct? Like we approved one that I don't think has gone really anywhere, and so if, after a certain amount of time, that we're going to sort of take that back, right? I'm talking about the have one. To, I'd have to check on that. I yeah. believe okay. there is. That's all. Why don't we come back with a schedule? Okay. Yeah. yeah, we can give you a report yeah. on, on first. Third. Third. Yeah. yeah, we can help answer that, but it's a good question and good part to focus on on this. Okay. So again, other um, portions of the PEP program is an upper floor rent relief program to help with the first tenants coming through, as well as utilization of uh, water and wastewater EDUs, which has a value of um, just under 14000 Other incentives um, that can be layered with this is the Enterprise Zone Property Tax Credit, which is both um, city and county property tax credits for 10 years on a sliding scale on those uh, across those 10 years the washington county new job tax credit also offers uh, property tax that would be taken uh, credits that would be taken after the enterprise zone is applied and the enterprise zone program has income tax credits for the creation of new jobs what What's the purpose of providing free EDUs? Does that mean for new construction? Correct. Because I'm um, assuming most of the buildings now probably have EDUs that are above it, what they would be calculated out for redevelopment anyway. In this case, we're dealing with parking lots. Um, okay. One has a little bit of, uh, of uh, allocation. The other does not have okay. any. But with the re even with the existing buildings, the ones that have been sitting empty for a while, they don't have, typically don't have sufficient allocation to fully reoccupy. Okay. From what I understand in Salisbury, those EDUs were what got 
a developer interested in their empty lot that they're trying to sell and redevelop as well. Getting into the um, recommended term for the developer designation, and this is, comes from recommendations from urban partners, is to designate the partnership for a minimum of five years. Okay, can I ask a question there? Sure. Um, Kristen mentioned a moment ago about the Baldwin House. Um, that was a total disaster back when that took place. Uh, and if, if, um, so, uh, if, if they had had uh, some kind of a limitation, um, a shorter limitation than five years, perhaps somebody, somebody could have uh, moved in there. I, I recall, as I recall it, uh, there were two developers who, who um, wanted to develop that property and the then city council decided on a developer who, who, who did absolutely nothing there. The other developer was a much more substantial individual, a community guy, who would have made something out of it. Uh, and maybe ultimately it worked out the way it should have worked out, but uh, back then it didn't. So why, why five years? Why not three years, for instance? I think it gives the developer a significant amount of time in an in a economy that is still recovering to identify the tenants to come into the building. Um, there, there would be, in combination with the five years, the opportunity to have performance benchmarks that the okay. developer needs to meet at different time periods in that five-year um, uh, designation. So I, I think there's opportunity, as you see in the next bullet point, that um, we would be able to reserve the right to terminate if certain performance measures are okay, not good. met. Um, so that gives us that a makes shorter feel period more of time if needed. Thank you. And we're going to get into some of the criteria later on in this. Um, also, the idea that the designation period could be extended beyond five years. Um, some thoughts here from urban partners is um, that the developers' efforts have resulted in at least 40,000 square feet of new construction um, during the initial period of time and that we're satisfied with the performance measures that we put into place. A little more about the uh, selection process. that. Staff will review submissions and select a short list of candidates for interview. The interviewed candidates will be ranked by staff, and we will recommend a candidate um, to the mayor and city council who will make a presentation. And then mayor and city council will authorize staff to enter into detailed contract negotiations with this selected candidate, again, an RFQ for qualifications to identify a partner, but subject to um, detailed contract negotiations. And that this negotiations would look at specific marketing efforts that the developer would undertake, agree to undertake, and the communication between the city and the developer, responsibilities on the part of the city in, in uh, the timing of the plan review, provisions for parking, transfer of land and the timing. Also the developer's responsibility to document their financial capability for the completion of the development. And if we cannot achieve an agreement with the um, first selected uh, developer candidate, that we would proceed with negotiations with an alternative candidate subject to approval from the mayor and council. So there could be a subsequent round to identify the final partner. So, so the approval of mayor and council would be, you would come to us and say, uh, we, we tried with candidate A, here's the reasons it doesn't work. And we would either say, go back and try again, or yes, you're authorized to go to the next person. Is that? Right. Do I have that right? Yes. Okay. Some selection criteria, uh, their experience mm. in office development and recruitment of office users, knowledge of office markets uh, in similar areas uh, and market size to Hagerstown, the quality of their proposed marketing and recruitment approach, 
capability of their staff, financial capability. And then we get into more detail here with the submission requirements, wanting, of course, the name, legal description, resumes, description of their experience in development, office buildings and campuses, description of their experience uh, in the greater Hagerstown area, as well as the Maryland, D.C., Virginia regional market. Identification of individuals that would be responsible for marketing the site and their resumes. Discussion of their financial capability. Um, evidence, past evidence of having undertaken at least a $10 million development somewhere and description of how they would structure the financing and lender references. <clears throat> Examples of uh, marketing materials and more detail about their approach to recruit office tenants and indications of what resources they will invest in the marketing and description of the type of office users that they feel they could best recruit and target initially. and a statement uh, from them it, with any questions or concerns they have in marketing this location or completing the development. So as Kathy said, we were guided by Urban Partners in, in um, presenting this draft um, and we welcome any uh, refinement and um, it plus the opportunity for Mayor and Council to work on this more on the 18th. We are anticipating coming back at the next work session to give you more time to digest it. I have one question um, and I think it uh, is much like the question I had about the university housing and that is while I know we have identified a couple of sites uh, I have some curiosity that we've identified M&T building, and I'm assuming we've probably done that a little bit because it is one of the, uh, you know, it's already sort of structured as, as an office building. It's probably of, of a good quality, comparable to other buildings in the block that you've identified. But I guess maybe that begs the question of there are clearly other buildings within the block surrounding the central lot that, that uh, you would... Uh, yeah, that some may prefer to 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 see transformed in into something like this over what I would consider a comparably better quality uh, current m and building and so I, I'm assuming within this that we aren't limiting limiting ourselves to the three sites that you've shown in other words if there are one or two or three of the buildings within this block that, that, that express an interest to negotiate and offer up uh, their properties uh, at some competitive price for this very same project that we wouldn't preclude that from being part of the discussion. Uh, well, let's take the, the four building property over here next to uh, the lot or you know, some semblance of properties beyond City Hall uh, here uh, along Franklin. I think like M&T Bank in, in this arrangement that the negotiations is, is subject to, uh, or the acquisition of the M&T land is subject to direct negotiations between the selected developer and M&T. Right. Um, and I'd any developer could do that with any property owner currently in town if they had such an yeah. interest. The idea of this is that it would be a catalyst to provoke those right. developers to be interested in acquiring yeah. private property. But I would take issue with the fact that M&T is a good building because architecturally speaking, yeah. it's not very aesthetically integral to the downtown. It also has the curb cut for the drive through, which we don't really like so much. And I think it's proximity next to the city owned property is what makes it. But I don't I want to make sure that this. we're not. And I understand what you're saying, that any developer could do this with any property. All I'm saying is that the difference being in this specific case, we've sort of set money aside, come up with this RFQ, and, identi and, and already identified uh, the limitation of those three properties to this proposal. And, and I think 
what Urban Partners recommended that we do this with the surface parking lots as a way to, to jump start the idea mm -hmm. of Class A office construction downtown because right now all of these incentives are in place already and we're not getting Class A renovations or, or redevelopments of the old buildings that are around the downtown area. And so it was feeling was in order to bring someone in, it would be easier to build on a surface lot than to convince someone that we're trying to recruit to take on either renovation of an old building initially mm -hmm. or to buy it from someone, tear it down, and then start the, the construction. We felt that in order to get this started, that we probably had to go with low-hanging fruit, which is parking lots. Yeah I, yeah, I completely understand the dynamic. All I'm saying is if somebody came through the door within the next three-month period while we're vetting this process and said, you know what, I've negotiated with these four private properties right over here, and I'm going to raise them similar to what Bowman wants to do for the school for this type of office complex, and I want to be in the door on this 250K to do that, that we wouldn't say, now nah, we're waiting to do this with the M&T or our surface lots. Well, the council can always authorize I, more money for the first third program, too. I just want to make sure that that, 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 that is, is at least I think if we had a an opportunity out proposal on uh, West Washington, or I'm sorry, East Washington, we'd certainly bring it to Marin Council mm -hmm. and okay. say we've got, we've got something good yeah, to look at. We were just that's, I think the uh, Urban Partners report even speaks to the fact that this type of um, RFQ and developer activity will result in other interests in other sections mm -hmm. of the downtown. So that's its catalytic nature. Right. Um, and it will, could result in other new construction, could result in other uh, renovation, even B space, um, when there are uh, tenants looking for more price sensitive options to the Class A offering, it's going to have a spillover effect to other buildings and other projects. So I would suggest we all digest this as Bruce suggested, and we will have it on the agenda. I think we have it on for the 18th. Right, to bring uh, it back, just just one, one editorial comment. Sure. Um, the acronyms need to be, uh, presuming we're sending this out to people up and down the East Coast, all over the country, explain. we need to explain the acronyms, even EDU. We need to explain, you know, have, have it clear what that is. But all the local acronym, USMH, A&E, CMFA and stuff. Alphabet soup. Yeah, you know, we need to make sure that that's clear to outsiders. And then, just to be clear on the schedule, what you're suggesting is if the Marin Council are okay on the 18th, then we'd start advertising the RFQ because of holidays, give people up until March 1st to submit proposals. Right. Right. I have a comment. Uh, I want to uh, commend you all on this document that was in our packets, uh, which is a different format than we just saw up here. This is an incredible piece of work. I mean, this is so detailed, so thoughtful. Um, I mean, this is this is really a good piece of work, and I, I want, wanted to say that. Thank you for uh, for putting set together such a good piece of work in this effort, because this effort is really going to be important to the success of Havers Town. Thank you. It was Indeed. a good Thank team you. effort with staff and urban partners. Thanks a lot. And I know we are woefully behind on our schedule, and I'm hoping Mr. Sargent can condense his 10-minute presentation into five minutes or less. I will just think it, and we'll receive it. <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for allowing the opportunity. I think everyone's uh, familiar with the City Center Dollars Program. It's a uh, coupon uh, gift certificate program uh, used in uh, participating downtown businesses. Uh, they can be purchased through the CVB or directly through our office. Uh, around the holidays, we incentivize them. Uh, for every $20 that you spend in the city center dollar program, uh, we, uh, this, the city supports with an extra $5. So with that in mind, uh, the program, I'm just going to quickly go through this. Uh, the program in 2012, it was started in 2012 for the general public. Uh, uh, for the, in, in time for the holidays, $4,175 went to the program. Last year, 
just over $30,000 went for the program, through the program. And this year we're on track to, to uh, hit more than uh, $60,000 through the city center dollars program. That's great. I mean, that's exactly the kind of thing that we want to see, but that's come at a big, uh, at a big expense, uh, staff uh, time-wise and also uh, merchant time-wise. There's a lot of money that the merchants are collecting in certificates that they have to wait a little bit, a little bit of time to get their, their uh, money back from. So we did some research and uh, came up with a, uh, a program uh, run through uh, uh, giftcards.com. It's an affiliate, uh, affiliate with the giftcards.com uh, that uses a closed loop merchant system. Basically, it's, a, it is a, it's a, your traditional gift card, but it's piggybacked on the Discover network. The Discover credit card network is the only network there where you can designate what merchants participate. And we don't want it to just be a Visa gift card and somebody goes outside the city limits uh, with the uh, wouldn't, wouldn't benefit the downtown businesses the way the program is designed. Uh, so we came up, we, we've, we've uh, identified this company that hosts this program. Uh, it changes it a little bit. You can no longer do $5 uh, increments for the gift cards. They start at $20. It's a little bit of a heftier program. But uh, we feel that with the proper marketing and, and, and such that we will we'll be able to turn this program uh, into a real, uh, into exactly what it has been for, for the downtown merchants. Uh, so just to run through some of the uh, aspects of it real quick, there are the gift cards. You go online and purchase them. Uh, they can be personalized. If you can hand it out as a gift, it says it'll be branded as a city center dollars gift card. It'll have the person's name, your name, or your gift recipient's name and printed on the card. They're printed in area right of Pittsburgh. They, they're mailed to you very quickly. Uh, there is a small shipping and handling uh, fee for $2.95 uh, on up, uh, uh, depending on how much of a gift card it is. But those are expenses that, that we can, just like the City Center Dollars program currently, we can incentivize that and add money onto the card for $20. It could become a $25 card during the month of uh, December. Uh, it has some of the same flexibility that we, that we enjoy with the current system with uh, a lot less staff time and immediate payback to the vendors because it does go through their credit card machine. And is, uh, and is do they have to accept Discover Card or how they, does that work? They do. In a survey of our current uh, city center dollar participants, nobody doesn't accept, everybody accepts the Discover Card. And if, and, if you, and if you don't, it's calling your credit card company and say, hey, I'd like to be lit up for the Discover card. It's not, it's not a, big, uh, a, a big hassle. Do normally, help <clears throat> me understand this, mm -hmm. when I swipe my credit card, the merchant is charged like a real small fee? It's a very small fee. Does and, that and also apply in this case? It would too? apply in this case. The payback on that, though, and that's, and we've, that's been the question, like we, we've talked to the Downtown Alliance about this and, uh, and, and other organizations, but the, the pay, right now when a, when a merchant collects a city center dollar, say, you know, over the course of a month, they get $200 and it's sitting on the register and, and we, we reimburse on a monthly basis for that. That money is sitting, you know, sitting there waiting, just waiting to be, be, to be reimbursed. It's more worth it for them to get that money back immediately with their credit card uh, batch out that night. There were days when the credit card fees were different than they are now. They, they're, they're so minimal that they're, it's almost as good as cash anymore. The, the percentages are pretty small. They are. They are. Uh, and most people don't. I mean, those, those of us of the older generation still use cash every so often, but I think the vast majority I was just uh, curious. Funny looks here, I'm glad to know. <laughs> I just was checking to see if yeah. Andrew's talked with the merchants and that they, you know, it yeah, sounds absolutely. like that's all been done. So yeah. It sounds like a great program to me. Sounds it really, great to me. What do you need from us? Up Absol uh, nothing other than a heads up, uh, and we're going to be marketing and pushing this out. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them now or later. And uh, City Center Dollars is growing up. Sounds like it's yeah. booming. Just, just real quick, you have to go online to do this. The best way to do it, I think uh, we are going to be able to sell prepaid cards uh, like at the CVB, but that gets a little cumbersome. The best way to do it is to go online, and we're going to be marketing the, the heck out of it. Uh, go online to purchase your, your, okay, your cards. Marketing yep. was one of my big things because if you're going to do this November 15th, you better market it. We're, and I think the incentivized season, when we can add on a little bit, is going to be the December shopping season this year rather than the two months that we did last year. Okay, but, but if somebody just doesn't have on, online or doesn't want to do that, we're going to have like the CVB or mm -hmm. the, the City Hall clerks yep, or whatever. Yeah, come to our office and we can figure, yeah, okay. sure, yeah, we'll be ready for them. So I'm going online mm -hmm. and I'm going to use my Visa card <laughs> to purchase 
to purchase one of these. You are, yeah, absolutely. So that it can only be used within Discovery System. That's that is. I have to give Discovery credit. It's welcome to clever. 2014. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a different world, but uh, but that's the way it works. Okay, thank you. Well, you get your miles and everything else when you <laughs> right, buy them, right, and uh, right. Any other questions? All right. Thank job. you very much. You. Keep up the good work. All right. Let's talk about snow. I predict. I predict another heavy snow season. So you're going to snow? Just what I want to hear. You're going, you're going to snow us? Or? I don't know if that's wishful <laughs> thinking on my part or well, I've done this crazy for thinking. Fifteen years and. Every year, somebody talks about being such a harsh winner. I mean, it's one always, of these years you got to be right. <laughs> they have been right several times, but <laughs> we're always hoping they're not. So, <laughs> this is more informational um, piece than anything. Um, I've presented this a number of times before. I was kind of walking down through this, and it's getting late, so we'll kind of get through this quickly. But suffice to say that we I've written here about some manpower equipment and material that we use um, we do have a number of uh, trucks uh, in fact at this point most of them are already the larger trucks are already put together the salt spreaders and the plows are already ready to go typically by Thanksgiving we want to have everything up and running because by that time we start to lose a few people to holidays and some vacations and things like deer hunting and whatever else um, and the last couple of years we've had snow in early December um, a couple of years ago we even had in October which was a very bizarre and out of the out of the way type of um, event that occurred but we do have uh, most of the uh, manpower we use is out of public works uh, when we go to 12-hour shifts we usually have to borrow people from other departments and whether that's uh, utilities with water department mainly or parks um, we do have enough equipment for all that we just don't have enough men to run 12-hour shifts just out of public works um, so then we borrow from other uh, other departments uh, basically what we're putting down is a calcium chloride uh, which is basically just rock salt for the most part um, that we use. On the next page, talk about a little bit about snow fighting operations and guidelines. Uh, for the most part, I've got several scenarios there and conditions, but suffice to say that condition one and two are typically what we're dealing with. Temperatures in the 20s and 30s. Uh, temp uh, typically, when you're getting below 20, 22 degrees, the salt becomes much less effective. Um, but we're, you know, as you read through that, you'll see that we're using snow plows to plow and laying down, you know, X amount of salt as we do those operations. Freezing rain's a little different. Every storm is a little different. Every storm has its little, um, characteristics. what's that? Characteristics. Yeah, they have the char that's a good term, characteristics. So, but they all, they all pretty much are handled the same way. We have a full crew that comes in, um, we get them out on certain routes. We'll talk about that a little bit later. We're doing snow plowing. Our priorities are the main roads, such as Franklin, Washington, Potomac, Hamilton, Oak Hill. Those are the main streets. Um, they are prime and uh, primary or priorities when we're plowing. And then we work our way to the secondary streets, which would be like Garlinger and some other streets like that, you know, the more residential areas. Um, and then we work our way. Typically, we're trying to also do sidewalks um, after the fact also. Our main priority is to get the streets open so we can get fire and police and um, through the city if, if, if that's needed and that people can move through the city also. Um, as far as sidewalks downtown, we have a number of buildings we have to maintain the sidewalks on. City Hall, of course, being one of them, but we also have the Rosen Building, Elizabeth Hager. We're now in several other buildings, 170 um, West Washington, 53 West Washington, that sort of thing. So uh, we do also bar some other people from other departments also go in and help us with those sidewalks. There are codes on that you have to plow the width of your sidewalk or, or minimum 48 inches that's all designated within code you have to have the sidewalks clear within so many hours of, uh, of the storm ending unless it storms certain and I've attached that part of the code um, in here um, for your use for your view the um, alleys and driveways we always get questions on that um, we do plow some alleys uh, but they're always the last thing we'll do there are a number of residents, uh, apartment buildings on some of the alleys that have been in place for years. We have those on a plow list for a smaller truck. We'll make sure that we hit those alleys. Um, we do some other alleys, depending on the, on the type of storm that we have. We may just salt the alley, we may plow the alley. Um, driveways, unfortunately, when you plow by, it leaves a windrow. We always get questions about what do we do with that. The bottom line is we plow by and it's up to the, the property owner to clear their own 
they're in driveways. Um, private streets, like in Cortland Manor, we do not plow. And if you go to that area, we basically go to the top of the hill where the post office is, make a left, go to the cul-de-sac, that's it. The rest of those properties back there are never, have never been accepted by the city, so they are maintained by the, by the uh, Landowner Association. Um, some general issues um, that has to do with um, um, having here about sawing to other places, uh, parking spaces. We try to push snow to the end of a parking, uh, like along Franklin or Washington. We may try and plow that out to the end of a space. We may block a space or two, but the, at least the rest of them are cleared. We have staff do that either late at night, if we're still here, or early in the morning before traffic really picks up. But the idea is to keep as many parking spaces open, as many um, lanes of travel open as, as much as possible. Well, that's pretty much snow plowing and that sort of thing. When you get snow removal, it's a little bit different uh, situation. Costs can be very expensive because typically we have crews coming in late at night. It's hard to remove snow during the day with all the traffic. Um, but we do try to, uh, years ago, we, we kind of contract some of that out. But now we can actually take our spreaders off our trucks, convert them into put them right back as dump trucks, haul the snow and ready to go, put the, put the uh, spreaders back on, and uh, we can pretty much do that pretty efficiently. The blizzard of 2009 and 10, we were pretty much hauling snow within four hours of the storm ending. As soon as we got done plowing, we converted over and started hauling snow. We have some locations in downtown off Church Street that we can haul to. We push it up in the parking lots. We can haul to our location on Potomac Street. We can also take it to the stadium if we need to. So we have locations in and around the downtown that we can get to quickly and get right back on the job site. Um, as far as cost, uh, the budget this year is set at $358,900. I've attached a sheet from Munis showing what our costs have been. Last year we spent a little over half a million. The year before, about a quarter million. The year before, 118000 So. Mayor, it's your guess as good as mine is what we're going to spend this year. So we put a budget in there and um, hope we stay within that bounds, but you just don't know. We did find out this year, and what I don't have in this memo is we typically piggyback off a state contract for salt. Salt and price went way up, right? Salt prices have gone up. Um, they haven't been set yet. Usually, typically by now, the state has contracts in place. We piggyback on that contract. I've already been in here getting your approval on, on purchasing it. Um, they're negotiating with contractors that they've had in the last year or two. I think they got one more price coming in this Friday. But last year we paid around $68 a ton. This year they're talking about prices of $90 to $120 a ton. Wow. So it's, and part of their saying is that basically in the last five years, most of these suppliers have only received about a 2.5% increase. So now the suppliers are saying we can't continue to, you know, supply on this sort of cost. So we're hoping they, you know, are more towards the 90, I guess, if we have to, if we have to do that. But yeah. the state also changed. We used to, Hagerstown used to be separate. Um, yeah. It would be Washington County and um, Hagerstown was, was separate. We usually got a little bit better price because we have one location where Washington County, they have several locations to deliver to. Well, that's, they've kind of done away with that. So whatever the county pays, that's what we'll be paying. So once we get that, um, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, um, we'll talk to the uh, contractor and come back in the council and get approval for that. But the prices are going up, unfortunately. Um, I've attached a map in here. A little hard to read, but if you look at this map, basically this is color-coded. These are different plow routes that we have. We split the city up into six with the major routes um, in which our truck drivers can go. We also have these in individual maps so that each driver has a list of streets on it knows which streets they're supposed to be on and where they're supposed to be at in the city. It's uh, somewhat, I'll say, antiquated because it's paper, but it works fairly well. Most of the drivers know pretty much where they need to be, and it gives the supervisors a quick and easy reference as to where everybody should be and what they should be doing. Other than that, like I said, I got the code attached to it uh, for general provisions regarding snow and ice removal and sidewalks, and uh, Munis, where you can see the cost that we've, um, the budget for this year and the cost the last few years. And that's pretty quick. There's a lot more information in there if you're welcome to read. So suffice to say, we have a plan. And so far, it's worked pretty well the last few years. So. We have at times, but not very often. You, just you mean for it. removal? 
Yeah. Yeah. Typically, if we're in the middle of Within a sorority, 40, let's say 48 hours goes by. Yeah. You know, it's supposed to be four hours after, but 48 hours goes by. I'm assuming you're not posting a notice and waiting 10 Are days. Are you talking about for sidewalks? Yes. No. The, we don't do any enforcement. Code would do the enforcement. If there's a sidewalk. That maybe that's the question I'm asking. Code is because some of the, the complaints I've heard is that, you know, by the time you post, it's turned into ice. Yeah. And I mean, I, 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 if, if, that's, if that's the case, and I don't know, you know what, what we're doing at the moment, but, but if, I, I would almost be open to a discussion of uh, subcontracting out uh, after 24 hours. I, I and, think they and, do have contractors that they do that. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious whether, them, whether they post a notice, you know what I mean? I, I would or think do they it. do, but you'd have to ask yeah. them. I'm sorry. I know they have the Snow Angels also, which I know you've participated yeah, in, which they can, they can do. So It's just in that district, I think it would be nice to, within 48 hours, it's cleared. I mean, there's no, there's no waiting on notices. There's no, it's just, right. yeah, great. it's just there should cleared. Be an absolutely great there job. should be a blanket notice. Like, send everybody a letter. Like, here's your, before the snow even falls, here's your first warning. If you don't pick up your snow, we're going to do it, and we're going to charge you for it. We don't have to do the and send them a notice and wait ten days. No, and I, I agree. In the send them a blanket notice. Here's um, here's what the expectations are. This is just you know, and if you don't do it, this is your warning that we are group. just going to charge you. Yeah, Typically, I mean, I would just, and there's always and there's properties downtown that are foreclosed on, unfortunately. It is. You know I would rather you know just the go not through, send uh, get it cleared. Hour, so. uh, with with a sub and 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 deal with the well in, the in, issue in, afterward. And in, in the other issue that. You know, I, I've talked to Bruce about this in years past, and it's an expense. But the other issue is when you talk about incentives for our downtown, you know, all the things we're trying to do to get businesses downtown. Quick handily, I'm not so sure that the best, most effective way to deal with snow removal in the very central core is to have the city just do it. Um, you have a, a lot of landowners that are out there with shovels. Uh, that are out there trying to get it cleared mm -hmm. and we have equipment and I'm just not so sure that the best way to deal with it isn't just to clear it. And, and I think that in that vein, I think that the way we've defined the CBD here is probably wider, probably twice as wide as what I envision the CBD really being. I would agree. I, I mean, I, I envision houses. a four block area and, and this is defined as more of like a 10 block area, mm -hmm. if, it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying now. Have you ever thought about uh, like heated sidewalks? I thought of heated streets, but you know. And that way we- <laughs> It's all a matter of money, man. I'd be out of right. a job. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a great, listen, Hagerstown Trust has it in the, in the courthouse. Well, I mean, there's- right. uh, The, the no. courthouse definitely has it. And, and the issue becomes, when you replace the sidewalks, uh, it, it's something to think about. Mm -hmm. But that again becomes, you're not going to have a, a landowner who has a very small area yeah. do it. It would have to be. A, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess I envision a three block stretch this way, a three block stretch on Franklin and a three block stretch on, on Washington that's just cleared. No questions asked, it's just cleared. You know, I don't envision, because this includes like Mulberry and Locust. I don't envision no, those. No, no, I think we're looking at My envision is that that three block area of Potomac, Franklin, Washington just cleared. Yeah, you, you, look, at, you look at places like the library, district court, circuit court, that gets a lot of foot traffic and that are generally open. And, and then you come up to City Hall. But, you know, it's hard to direct staff to do that now without getting what the price point is yeah. on it, and that becomes a whole different story. But and all I'm saying is for this year, I think that, that you just sub that out and you just you do it. You know what I mean? There's gonna be a cost factor mm -hmm. in a subsequent budget year, but for this year, I would just, I would be curious what that would look like to just, you know, the ones that aren't, there isn't a posting a notice and waiting 10 days, it's, it's clear. And for this year, for it would not be that expensive be because again, you can identify, we have identified Right, the, 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 the six to 12 that properties it that it's going to be on over and over. Mm -hmm. Go to the reach shelter, I'm sure you'll get some and, there. And I'm not talking about taking your staff away because I know you guys are going to be you know, up to your ears when, when those events occur. I'm talking about just subbing it out for those six or 12 properties and just being done with it. You know, I, I don't think that's a bad idea. In fact, I think it's a good idea, except there probably are some merchants downtown that have long-term contracts with 
-hmm. with no, private no. people who do and this. And that's why I said for this year, right. the ones that are doing it keep doing it, but the ones that we identify that are repetitive abusers of just not doing it, mm -hmm. you know, the notice thing obviously isn't working. You know what I mean? But yeah, and, and Well, I can talk with John and we can do right that in, sure. Okay. Good job. Thanks for that thorough update. <laughs> okay. Moving on. Um, public works in general. Um, there's not a whole lot in here on large projects, uh, per se, um, finances being what they are. Uh, let me just start off by saying um, this is kind of a general overview of public works, what we're doing right now, what's going on here in, in the recent uh, or in the near future. Suffice to say that uh, public works is pretty much, we have five areas of responsibility, which are streets, which we've talked about a little bit here, building maintenance, traffic control, fleet maintenance, and parking. The reason I wanted to emphasize that is because they're all very distinct, different things that we do there uh, with the staff we have. Um, we have 24 field personnel, we have two support staff, and then five command staff, which includes myself and four supervisors. Um, then we also have a dozen or so part-time and seasonals through the year that works. Our budget's a little about around $3.2 million. We've had five, and I didn't write this, five unfunded vacant positions. Um, the first of those actually became vacant in 2009, February 2009. Um, the remaining of those were later in 2009 and 10. So we've been shorthanded for, for some time. Um, the position I actually took with the city was the assistant manager of public works in, in 1999. In 2000, I became the manager, and eventually the assistant manager was well it was never filled when i took over and that position has been vacated so it's not even an unfunded position but i'll come back to that in a second but so street trees so we have street trees recently there was a group in here talking about the emerald ash borer uh, we work closely with engineering and with some other uh, people in the city regarding the removal of trees trimming of trees that sort of thing um, the city's getting ready to plant 500 additional trees um, there's about 2,400 trees is the estimate that we recently got from uh, DNR on the street. So those are typically trees between the curb and sidewalk that we maintain. Um, the Emerald Ash Board, which we talked about before, was, uh, we're going to look at the 35 or 40 trees. We'll see in the spring how well they're doing. And then we'll probably try and save as many of those on the street as we possibly can. And that would be through a uh, um, uh, insecticide program, that sort of thing that we would do. It's a little different than Parks, where Parks is losing hundreds. We only have a few, so cost-effect-wise, might be better try and save them than to try and remove them. Um, on storm drains, there's currently over 4,000 storm drains. That, that goes up every year. That new development comes online if we've accepted the street. Um, we basically are maintaining those, whether it's cleaning them or, or rebuilding them over time. All those structures get worn and need, need reconstruction. Uh, street sweeping is an important function of our street department. We have mm -hmm. two street sweepers that run all the time. This time of year, they're basically picking up leaves is what we're really doing, trying to focus on that part of our program. A number of year ago, years ago, we started uh, permanently posting streets in the downtown, which is I think has worked really well. Um, we have very few complaints about that program. Most people live downtown and adapt to it very quickly. Um, I think it helps keep the downtown uh, in very good shape. Um, from In my opinion, it seems to be working very well. Uh, as I said, right now our primary function is is, uh, is leaves uh, for the most part. Um, property management, building maintenance. Um, I've listed some tenants that we have here. You can see it's quite a variety. Everybody from the state to the University of, um, University of System of Maryland. Um, market vendors. We have Spickers Market, Ties App, some residential units now that come online. Um, so we have quite a variety that it's going on that we're maintaining uh, right here in the heart of the downtown. Um, we're also working right now with DCED on the market house with some projects that you're aware of. Um, so we're currently over there working, moving some vendors around and doing some other work that's going to be coming up soon. Uh, we got some work on the fourth floor that'll be done later, probably December, January, which is mostly painting, a little bit of floor work, some other things that's here in city hall. Um, in future years in 2016, we need to paint the clock tower city hall. If you look at it during the day, you can see it's. Um, but it's all a matter of budgeting money where we, you know, priority. So that's coming up. Um, we also would like to eventually, you know, do some air conditioning. This room is air conditioned, but it shares its air conditioning with the first floor. So when you're here Tuesdays and you got air conditioning, the people below you have none. So we have to switch that. It's, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a bizarre system, but, uh, but it's very expensive to put air conditioning in here. And with a building like this, it's tough to, to, to 
constructed inside an existing building such as this. So there's some projects coming up in that. On traffic control, no real major issues. There's a project going on here. We have 131 signalized intersections that we maintain. Uh, 35 of those are actually state highway on um, Franklin and Washington Street. Um, the state does pay us $1,500 a year per intersection. So we get about $52,000 from the state to help maintain those, those traffic uh, signals. We work closely with engineering on the timing of traffic signals. We also use a group called um, Cyber Wang that does a lot of our signal. They'll go do the studies. They'll tell us how to adjust them, and then our staff will go out and take care of the intersections. Um, when signals are knocked down or, or busted or broken, our staff is out there um, to uh, get those up and running. Uh, on fleet maintenance, um, we currently have four mechanics in our shop, um, which is what's currently budget. We have over 300 vehicles, um, and we maintain the vehicles for every department, fire, police, utilities, parks, you name it, um, with those four mechanics. Uh, recently, what I wrote in here was about the gas boy system. That's a fleet management system. Uh, when we get fuel, they use a fuel card, so it identifies the vehicle. That system is up and running. I wrote in here it was be done soon. It actually is up and running. Uh, it seems to be working very well. Um, Washington County government contacted us some time ago. They are going to replace their fuel island at the Northern Avenue shop. They need our assistance. There's not enough room on site to set up a temporary fuel island. So this fuel line we installed, they actually paid for additional um, functions on it so they could use it. So later in 2015, the county will be fueling from our facility um, to help them out as part of our cooperation with Washington County. So we'll just have to keep an eye on that. They use a different card. They don't use cards. They use, key, they use like a key fob. So we had to program that in, and, and, and they paid for it. They paid for the extra, and what we'll do is we'll track their cost, and then they'll pay for whatever fuel they buy. Um, the next project for that pretty much is emergency generator, um, which shouldn't be too expensive, probably in a five to eight thousand dollar range. And for us, budget-wise, we have um, hopefully to bring back to you in the next month or two um, a large dump truck, some other trucks. We're looking at probably spending somewhere around three hundred thousand dollars this year on vehicles. <coughs> and fiscal year sixteen, we've got another two hundred sixty thousand program and another two hundred in the year after that. Yes. Is your central maintenance garage uh, full? In what full in what regard? Vehicles and 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 um, depends on the day. space. We, we, the reason I ask this is uh, uh, you know I've I've had this argument. Gosh, I think when I was a county commissioner that okay. the county doesn't have any type of central maintenance facility, and I just always found that you know the city's facility, if it could accommodate, could have taken over some of that function for the county similar to your, to your full fueling where, because I think they have one mechanic that works on all sheriff's vehicles and they have one garage, you know what I mean? They do, but they also have mechanics at the, on their highway department. Yeah. And then they also have a shop at their landfill and I'm not sure where else, but I know they have at least three separate yeah. facilities. So there are little shops. Yeah. Instead yeah. of having one central shop, they have three. Yeah. And so you understand our shop, actually we rent the space from city right. light. Um, that building. That's why I was be, wondering how yeah. full it is because depends I just on feel the like day. the county's Some days always had this fill. mishmash of little shops yeah. that that aren't any type of, of coordinated central effort. Yeah. Well, how many bays, Eric? I, I forget. Mike, how many bays are down there? Yeah, I think there's a, yeah, I think there's a and the one in the back would be nine. We took two bays a number of years ago and actually built our offices in those in that space. We have um, okay. right now currently two vehicle lifts. We have at least um, three pits that were already built into the facility because it used to be, it was actually designed for Greyhound bus, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it was Greyhound bus terminal. So we actually have a very good efficient space. Our staff over the years have built their own um, systems of, of uh, dispersing oils and fluids and that sort of thing that's right there where they're at. Um, we have staff that works with every department to get them in there for um, oil maintenance and all that sort of thing. So. Um, actually, it's a pretty good, it's a very good space. It's an excellent space there, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we pay a pretty low price. I think it's probably $2 a square foot or something. Well, we'll don't forget, if we so. do it, wage, wages, benefits, <laughs> shop supplies, yep. overhead, we've got mm -hmm. 95 bucks an hour. Okay. It's around 70, but yeah. No, no, 95, that's going. <laughs> shop supplies. Okay. All right. Any questions on fleet maintenance? Okay. 
The only thing I would say about central that's for outsiders, it's yeah, okay. 65 for, for us. Yeah, for central maintenance, it's not so much. It's not a facility where all the vehicles, every department kind of maintains their own vehicles per se, mm. or it's assigned their own vehicles. It's not like we have a, a pool of vehicles that you take a backhoe out and it goes to the utility. So in that regard, it's not so much central maintenance, but it is one location. I got you. But, yeah. Uh, the parking system. Parking system has uh, only two full-time staff members, and that's the supervisor and the, and the uh, gentleman that re reads, or not reads the meter, but maintains the meters and collects the fees, that sort of thing. Everybody else in parking is part-time. Um, and, and we've talked about this a number of times. Two parking decks, 11 parking lots, on-street parking is all part of the parking system. Revenues are somewhere around the $900,000, depends on the year. Um, expenses are somewhere in a ballpark of seven dollars to $800,000. Um, that did come down in, the last, in 2012 when we paid off the debt service to, to the uh, university deck. Um, but we're still paying the debt service, obviously, on A&E. We've also done $300,000 repairs. And in the years coming up, we've budgeted money for our parking lots. Um, we continue to put money in, in the next few years for parking lots and the decks for continual maintenance. We kind of renovated, I'll say, the Church Street parking lot. We had it slurry sealed, new line striping. Next year, we'll work in a central lot. After that, we kind of go to the Rochester lot and the market lot then again. So we are budgeting money as we go out in the next few years to make sure that we maintain our, our facilities. Uh, we're also, as we've talked in before, we're talking about focusing on the construction of the third parking deck. So we're watching our, our numbers a little bit on that. Um, if you see, <coughs> we can report, what I'm reporting there is the peak hour of each week. Um, and A&E is somewhere, I think, 70 or 75%. But that's only certain hours. But most of the time, on average, we're probably around 55, like we said earlier, 55 to 60% occupancy overall. A&E deck occupancy picks up Friday nights, Saturday nights. University deck drops to probably 10% over weekends because it just simply isn't used. I so. heard maintenance next year for Central Lot. Uh, yes. Just be careful you uh, coordinate with DCED so we are right. fixing up a lot and tearing it out the next year. Yeah. If, they, if they obviously that project is moving forward, right, there's no sense of moving forward. Right. So we, have to so keep we touch need with them to not see. just do a blanket. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, I hope it does move that fast. If it does, well, great. Yeah, I mean, look at the relative timing, and it might be sectional. You might want to do it in sectional. Yeah. So to go back to the beginning of the memo, what I was talking about and, uh, on unfunded positions is I've been here before, talked to the mayor and council. It's been a little while regarding a position. The one supervisor maintains traffic control slash building maintenance. We have a lot of properties to maintain. I think everybody's in agreement that it's a good idea to split that position so we have somebody else overseeing our property management. The issue, of course, is funding, and that's where we're kind of, you know, we got to find some way to make that happen. Um, basically, a, a scenario today was um, two of my supervisors scheduled off, one was ill. So 75% of my supervisory workforce was missing today. So it was me and another guy that was running public works doing all the different functions that occur. That's not all the time, obviously, and I'm not trying to, you know, cry your river here, but I'm just saying we're a little thin at Public Works and what we have to maintain. So um, I guess I'm saying somewhere along the, along the way, we have to find a way to find funding to, to make some of these positions happen. Mr. Brubaker will get right on that. <laughs> I, I would echo that. I think the, the disadvantage Public Works has, other than the parking system, which is parking fund, the rest of it's general fund. Exactly. But he just doesn't have the opportunity to raise fees, licenses, kind of a, Right. Revenue sources that we're able to use to strengthen code enforcement and inspections, right. those, those areas. We don't have that opportunity here, so we're talking about tax dollars. But one of the general goals of doing this presentation and Mike's later on is to just kind of give you a heads up on potential budget issues, and that's, that's right. one for us along with the cost of the salt. And then Eric identified a number of projects that we're going to try to work into the budget in the coming year or in years beyond as, as we have funding. Mm -hmm. The uh, work on the deck, uh, A&E deck. A&E deck, yes. To protect the elevator. Yes. Um, That's turned into a bit of a money pit, huh? Yeah, well, everybody's happy it's done, though. Is it's, it done? As a, yeah. Done, done. Yeah, the elevator's been up and running, yeah. Okay. But in fact, uh, we just finished some work yesterday yeah. on a couple other because as it rained, we found a couple other areas that we needed to. Okay. Uh, we actually, 
uh, got permission from uh, Bowman Development to actually connect to their building, per se, with flashing, because the way the buildings were connected was, was an issue, or not connected, I should say, it was an issue. It was allowing water infiltration. Hmm. So we had to work with them to actually, so when it rains again, we'll find a couple of little spots, and we'll keep working away at until everything's Good. taken care of. Is there some kind of a warranty on that work? Yes. That was uh, that you all acquired, perhaps, to protect that elevator in the. On the elevator. And yeah. Not on the elevator, but the the whole thing to make sure that that well, does, doesn't happen again as a result of, of rain. No, because we did most of the work. We actually to, to shelter the, the shelter. We did that right, the shelter elements. Yeah, part of it was was installed by by a contractor, which mm -hmm. was a, a vestibule door and glass. And um, the other was uh, was actually constructed by us, so any issues we have with that, we'll just continue to fix repair wherever we need to do there. Yeah. Well, thanks for getting it done. Everybody. Yeah, it, it took a long time, but it was what the heavy rains this year basically just revealed a design flaw in the deck, which allowed so much water to flow. It just overflowed the system, and it kept flooding the elevator. Yeah. And I could have fixed the elevator months ago, but I had to fix this. There was no sense putting seventeen thousand dollars in elevator repairs, and then have it flooded again. Right. So we just had to kind of wait it out, unfortunately. But it's it's done. It's you working. Think it's all good now. It's all good. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Anything for else? That. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Moving right along. That's my promise. I'll start out with the uh, Nate's coming up too with the uh, with the water division. I'll give you a highlight of the projects, what what's we're looking at for the next fiscal year. Um, R.C. Wilson's been occurring now for about uh, 19 months, 18 months uh, project wise at 14 million. We spent I spent three hours today, Nancy, many more than me, at the plant. Uh, we're looking for a December substantial completion. And there's a few items that, that we have to work through. We're just still doing our loop, our loop and corrosion study. So we're hoping late spring that we can finalize most of the project and move forward with that. Um, our, we work now for many years on our uh, meter replacement program to get our, our MXUs in and get everything over to radio read. We're in the last year of that. Uh, that's helped us immensely in our revenue stream by putting in new meters, getting correct readings. We thank you all for your assistance over that through the years. Our um, distribution main program and our fire hydrant replacement which we do every year we spend about a 1.5 million dollars uh, working getting our transite pipe out of systems or any areas where we've seen uh, a large amount of breakage we like to go through and, and get those areas taken up uh, budgeted through each year on CIP Edgemont Reservoir a few issues up there number one we know we have a lot of ice trees up there too you've had a lot of discussion on that uh, we'll be contacting DNR again they had assisted us before uh, they've done a tree study for us on the whole watershed property to see if we need to go ahead and recoup some dollars out of that if they're going to die anyway to get in and do some selective logging uh, most importantly at our Edgemont Reservoir we've been uh, working for the past seven years uh, with some leakage problems on the tow we did a uh, uh, repair to the tow of the dam uh, a few years ago it continues to leak We've been meeting with dam safety um, for the last six months, I guess, f fairly regularly. We've been monitoring uh, the seeps that we have. Uh, we do that, uh, we're doing the engineering in-house on that for the actual review of the seeps, tracking that data with the assistance of Triad that goes to MDE. We will, and we have a few options there. We may end up with a consent agreement uh, in regard to uh, repairs of the dam. For future discussion, I just want to touch base on it right now. Uh, that dam is well over 100 years old. Uh, as we did a replacement uh, with our open stored reservoir at Helene Park now uh, years ago, there may be an opportunity for us to move to a different type of water treatment storage process at that area. Uh, we could and will probably look at utilizing uh, well installations at our Brickner property and maybe decommission the dam. We'll have further discussion. We need to do some studies on that. Uh, we're, we're looking. Can I just mention yep. real quick and we don't need any more conversation yep. on it at all because it's long term, but having been here for a long time, I'd like to know about the 
whole viability and requirements of the whole Brickner plant and that whole system out there. Is yes, that sir. something that is required, economically feasible, or is it something we need to keep? But that's obviously not a discussion for tonight. Yes, sir. It, it, we'll look at that when we come back with a study on, on what we need to do maybe with the, uh, with the dam. We're looking at millions of dollars. Uh, why, why spend millions of dollars on a dam? What is when the null hypothesis here? Is that what you're saying? I mean, mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll discuss it later, yes, right? Yep, yep. We'll, we'll probably have that to you sometime in the spring. that's required by MDE, um, and that'll be the basis of what MDE is going to require to move forward. It's a geotechnical study, um, and it'll look at the vol volume of seepage under the, um, the concrete spillway that goes down, but it also will evaluate um, the change in leakage or seepage at the tow drain. Um, and those proposals will be coming um, this month, or they'll be on the uh, consent agenda. Just another short note on that. We do have a great asset that we may be able to utilize if we do make a decision that the dam is no longer the way we want to move forward. We have a large amount of property that we could actually divest ourselves of. There's no reason to protect a watershed if we're not utilizing as such. So there's approximately 1,300 acres that we can offset some of our costs with that, mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll be bringing all those, the cost yeah, effectiveness of that back in us too. Talking about trying to develop a kind of a broad plan for that whole area, the yes. dam, the Brickner plant, gotcha. the, yes. the uh, watershed property, the watershed property. Come back to Baron Council's a bit yeah. longer term. Yeah, I think Lou's saying that we need that system. Well, I think that's one of the things. Yeah, that's, being discussed. that's, that's, that's that what we're looking at. Different yes. alternatives, wells, uh, yeah, decommissioning right. period, uh, you know, the dam. Yeah. There'll be numerous points out of that that right. we have to consider overall for it. Uh, once again, in for water, then we'll continue with our risk management plan. We've got some hazardous chemical plans. Our water master plan is nine years old. We'll be doing an update on that again. We've kept it updated, but we need to do an overall update on the, on the master for our long-term planning. And some of this, nine years ago, we didn't have in the plan, so it'll be all a part of it. On our uh, wastewater facility. Mike, I'm sorry to interrupt, but before you leave water, part of that water master plan was uh, the uh, transmission mains and several years ago we had a lot of discussion with the council about uh, plans to replace the 24 inch main so could you just yeah, explain where we're at on the, that right now in terms of the current thinking and yeah, the plans? Yeah, it's kind of the reason I left it to the end, more of an engineering function. Okay, I well, if no, it's okay, it I, I can do it then now because okay. um, so many other um, mandates have come from MDE that that kind of jumped in front of that just because of our financial responsibilities. Our 36 inch mains, uh, we developed a, a one phase program to take it from R.C. Wilson out to Virginia Avenue, which crosses under I-81, a large scale plan, 20 some odd million dollars. We've scaled it back now into phases. Fortunately for us, six, seven years ago, we had what we consider a large amount of breaks on the 24 inch line. We've been very fortunate the last few years. We, we've had some leaks, but we've had no major crack arounds or breaks on the, on the transmission system. So we're watching our system pressures, how we operate the system, trying to alleviate any of that. It's still there for us. We keep moving it out. At some point in time, we're going to have to address that as a major need also. Mm -hmm. uh, we think Edgemont financially is going to maybe move ahead of it right now and push it out a few more years. But you know, as the costs move exponentially, for a project of that nature, it was 17,000 feet some of, of, of main replacement. Are we up into the $30 million to the $40 million range now? We don't know, and that's why we phased it back, doing some valve replacement, which helps us. We did a small piece of 36-inch replacement at the plant three years ago to get us out to the end of our property. So we did start the project moving. Uh, once again, we've kind of moved it out a few out years. Continue our engineering groups working on it. It's there for us. It's going to be something to consider later on. Uh, the wastewater side, uh, uh, Cinegro, um, we came in with a contract for almost $900,000 for a sludge thickening uh, project. That's moving forward. We added another component before that to help us on our side uh, of the project beforehand. 
Uh, Joe's guys, uh, we're probably going to do a lot of that work in-house, but there'll seem be some additional cost in regard to that. Um, the maintenance guys are, have been a great asset to us uh, in trying to get some of this baseline work done for what Cinegro is doing, and I thank them all for that. Uh, collection system, uh, we did get one pump station, uh, offline pump station 12 at first data. Uh, we did uh, almost 600 uh, feet of of main installation all done in-house by the collection crews george and jeff and uh and all those guys worked on that and I thank them very much they tied into the parkway neuroscience uh, piece that they installed for us when they put the new building in uh, we've got some work to do um, on some of the other pump stations uh, eight and six dual highway and hcc will be some upgraded we're going to work to try to get pump station 15 at nolan village completely out of the system alleviate another uh, liability maintenance issue uh, for the city in regard to that. Uh, we're going to do a little up, another upgrade at the plant to get some of our magnesium oxide. We did a temporary tank there years ago. Magnesium oxide is like a giant Pepto-Bismol tank. So I think we all know that the good that it helps us down there. So we want to do something permanent in regard to that. Um, on the electric side, um, thank you last uh, last month for assisting us to get a new bucket truck that's 20 some years old. We'll have another one uh, maybe next year that's kind of in the same shape uh, that we'll be requesting a replacement on that. Uh, telemetry equipment, we're going to install some fiber optic cable between our substations, between plant and and basil, and then also from Snook out to Mitchell to kind of give us a better loop for SCADA and for security of our system. The HLD facility roof is fast approaching 30 years old. We've had some issues with that. We'll be coming in next fiscal year. We're probably looking at a $600,000 roof replacement on that, a butyl rubber uh, replacement, which will be state of the art and take us through the next 30 years. Hopefully a 30 year replacement life cycle on that also. Um, regulation, we had some talk on that earlier and, and uh, keeping the uh, critters away from our substation, uh, make sure everything's covered up on that. We continue uh, to work on those system improvements, uh, distribution feeder and system improvements, a yearly uh, program we use to, uh, you know, assist our customers to keep them in lights longer. It's a great help to us. So that we do have issues on the system that it coordinates correctly and doesn't take out large blocks of customers. I'll touch on the alleyway lighting uh, at the end. Our engineering group, uh, we do have a new employee there, Matt Muller is our project engineer. I think we'll all agree he's been a great addition to, to what we do in water and wastewater. Um, they're working on uh, some uh, stormwater permits down at the plant. They do a lot of the in-house work for us uh, on the engineering for removing the uh, pump stations out of service. On the wastewater side, they do mixing aeration systems in the tank. Uh, they're the ones that work on our 36-inch main replacement with our engineers to make sure that we get the correct baseline information in with them. They keep our specification manuals, updates, conservation plan, which we need to have completed to help with our sustainable Maryland. So he's actually working on that so we can get some points in that to help Rodney and the city make sure we attain uh, that designation for us. And last but not least... tank. It's been on the radar screen for several years and it's starting to become an eyesore. So that they're working on that bid and our hope is that we'll paint that in um, the late spring, early summer. It is funded in the FY15 budget so that'll be coming back, going out to bid and coming to Mayor and Council for uh, review and approval um, sometime here in the, in the next several months. But that's the, a little bit longer. You're saying the West End tank. The West, yes. It's that large white stand pipe beside the new tank that we built. Yes. The one that we did not disturb. It has a very odd paint discoloration on it that yeah. keeps surfacing it's on it. So we're going to mm -hmm. address that again. And rates real quick. Uh, we're, we'll be in the second year of a five-year rate plan for Ju water and wastewater next fiscal year. So Correct. No issues there, short term. No, the uh, water continues. Lights, yeah, electric good. rates. You're We're good. good until 2017, May right. 31, 2017 on electric rates, our five year plan. Once again, wastewater goes back to 4%. Nancy stays at 2% for each of the out years. So, you know, very, very minimal increases for our customers in, in regard to that.
And we stay well under almost all neighboring jurisdictions. I just want to emphasize Our that. Our closest jurisdiction, we are 30% right. less. We're running seven cents a kilowatt hour. They're running a little over 10. I've told a lot of people that. Yes, sir. Uh, an update on the um, alley lighting discussion that we had and some questions that came forth uh, last month. Uh, we did, Nathan, Jason did some further uh, engineering work on that for us. I think we had, as we had a discussion, our high intensity lights, they're not the kind that can be manufactured to come on. So we do have some other opportunities that we can work with in here in regard to sensor. We did put some of the engineering uh, specifications in that we use, you know, how far our lights are apart, how far they have to be. We have NESC standards that we do have to, we do have to meet. And we had some discussion in regard to the, the billing, the funding source, um, you know, the, so your recommendations made a lot of sense. Yes, and, and we'll work with uh, you know, John's group very closely for the homeowner uh, with HPD in regard to the alleyway lighting. There are certain functions that can be used that they can actually install. Mm -hmm. We can assist them with if needed that can be moved because I think as, as uh, Chief Holtzman spoke before, once you kind of get an area, it moves it somewhere else. This allows a fairly quick movement to a hot spot area same cameras can be utilized picture audible you know the flashing light or whatever so we can work on that uh, one thing i think for our, our residents how inexpensive it is to operate security lights uh, a lot of handy people can put them up uh, the 22 watt led flood at our rates if you run it three hours a night costs 15 cents a month to operate wow that's that was i guess the most uh that's yeah, piece of information actually stood out. So once again, working with, with John's group, if there's money available to help the residents that need to get those in for a certain amount of time, very inexpensive to operate, uh, we'll continue to work with both of those groups to see what's best for our citizens. Good job. Very Not bad. Good. Thanks for having us. Good. Thank you. Thank play, you all. We do, we do it, appreciate it, it seriously. <laughs> There's a lot of information here. Thank you. There is, yeah. Read. The memos are good, so you kind of get it. Yeah. And hopefully it gives you a we feel free. heads up for budget <laughs> budget season as well. That's the goal. So. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. City Administrator comments. Just a reminder, next Tuesday is uh, Veterans Day, so City Hall will be closed. There's no change in our refuse collection next week with that holiday, so everybody will stay on the same schedule. That's it for me. Thanks. Mr. Metzner. Um, I would just like to, again, commend Councilwoman Nye for all the work she did and staff, Karen and others, in putting together the concert, um, the utility relief concert. I thought it was a great success, and uh, she deserves great compliments for getting it done. Um, I think that's it. Great, Ms. Nye. And I will be giving you more on that as soon as we get all the other information in. All right. And all I can say is, is that Karen Giffen and myself are the ones that did the bulk of that fundraising. And Karen needs to have more staff. For what all she is putting together and what Urban Partners wants to happen in the downtown, that whole end, it's, there's has to be some adjustment. But it did, it went, it went very well, I thought. And thanks to Lou, he did the speaking for the mayor. Because Thank you, Lou. I just don't want to do that. <clears throat> but he carries it off really well. Also in the paper, I think it was this morning that the reach shelter is just about ready to reach its capacity. And what I'm anxious to see is where are the rest going to go? There's already been calls for services at the REACH shelter. So it's ambulance and police again that we continue to send out. That's it. Mr. Brubeck. Um, if you haven't voted, please get out and vote. There are several hours left. There are plenty of polling places. Get out and vote. Mr. Alshar. In one of the proposals we received tonight, uh, in, in this, I think, has been the case before. I know when Washington County does uh, engineering schematics uh, for outside uh, support, they identify, I think, five uh, engineering firms in which they sort of keep as in like an on-call. And I know 
uh, and, and I don't have any preference any way or the other, but as we talk about you know investment and redevelopment of downtown, uh, I think that, that Bushy Fight and Warren did the last one, and they did this one, and all I'm saying is I would assume that, that in any process for redevelopment projects, you would get to see some uh, thought processes from, from uh, a number of different architects. In other words, I, I want to make sure that as this RFQ goes out, that you know some schematic drawn on a piece of paper isn't what would be beholden to, if you will, you know what I mean? Because there's thousands of architects with thousands of opinions of, of creative minds that, that have ideas. I would assume um, that's for demonstration purposes. Yeah. Illustrative purposes only. Yeah. Not I just want to make sure that we're, we're clear on that because, like I said, I think there's, there's tons of architects out there with all kinds of crazy ideas on what you can do with space. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mr. Munson. Um, I thought the article in the paper today about the tearing down and melt was a great article. Um, it was described as a priority, and it's another example of where this, this mayor and, and city council are succeeding in improving the quality of life in, uh, in Hagerstown. Thanks. I just wanted to congratulate uh, everybody on getting Broad Fording Road open, even though there's still work to be done and uh, it's open to traffic flow. And I don't think uh, uh, anyone really expected it to be done that quickly. So kudos to staff for moving that project along. Also, because we won't be meeting next week and I won't be able to remind folks, we are having a free electronics recycling event on Saturday, November 15th at Municipal Stadium for city residents only between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. rain or shine. Uh, you can check the website for more information. Everybody should have gotten something in their electric bill or their latest utility bill describing what is accepted and what's not. But if you have questions, just call. And with that, we will be adjourned. Thank you.